Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Watership Down podcast. First of all, a little housekeeping. Um, there was a slip up last episode. This will become a regular feature, I, I suspect. Um, I rarely re record segments, preferring to just correct minor slip ups later on. So, last episode, I referred once to my being a fact of Watership Down rather than a fan. I'm not sure where that came from. Anyway, yeah, I meant to say fan. Um, Jeremy Downing from Ohio has been going through his collection of editions of Warship Down uh, in search of the lost paragraph. He's got a large collection. This is very helpful. We have a lot more information now, and I'll be feeding back with the results once I've crunched the information and found a way to put it on a spreadsheet in a way that makes sense. There's a lot of information here, and some patterns will emerge, I'm sure. Um, Mike, I really am very grateful to Jeremy for the work he's doing on this. Uh, there's no sermon this week. Sorry if I laid on the politics a bit thick last week, but I felt it necessary to emphasise the complete contrast between the ways I will analyse the two dangerous Warrens in Watership Down. Uh, you may have picked up that I regard Adam's, quote, just a book about rabbits, end quote, line as having been a way of avoiding awkward conversations. I have no actual evidence for this, but I do not intend in any case to avoid such awkwardness. After all, what kind of podcast would this be if all I did was tell you what happens in the books and films? There's got to be commentary, and for that, I've got to have opinions. Chapter 13. Hospitality. The opening quote is from Tennyson's The Lotus Eaters, and it's about a land you'd never want to leave because of an intoxicating fruit you'd never want to stop eating. Quite appropriate. As the group follow Cowslip, they have their first sight of his warren. The holes are all large and plain to see, with no attempt at concealment and obvious rabbit tracks crossing the field. A big, big shock by this. The rabbits that greet them are also, quote, sleek and unusually large, like cowslip. They greet Hazel with a dancing motion of the head and front legs that the group finds bizarre. They tell the group that cowslip is in the, quote, great burrow, and that they will all be able to join him. This is another surprise, given the usually restricted room in a warren. Hazel's group assumed that cowslip would not be chief rabbit, as he came to see them first, which is obviously not what a chief rabbit usually does. More on that later. Hazel had been nervous of them all being separated going into the warren, but there is apparently one space in that warren that can accommodate them all together. This seems incredible. He is so curious to see it that he forgets to decide properly who should go in what order. He also briefly thinks, in a shocking moment of callous or realistic leadership, that Pipkin should follow him, as he could be spared if they needed to escape, while Bigwig should bring up the rear in case they need to get away fast. He thinks Pipkin will appreciate following him into the Warren, which is true, but I still find the coldness of his calculation unexpected. Suddenly, he finds himself in a huge underground open space, exposed on three sides. He wishes he had larger rabbits immediately behind him. There are more rabbits than his group has in the burrow, all large and well-fed like cowslip. The way Adams describes how his finely chewed senses are able to tell so much about the space in the dark is well described. The great burrow is possible because of the tree roots in its roof. <clears throat> For a rabbit such as Hazel, it is the largest underground space he has been in. Hazel is unsure how to introduce his group and whether to call himself Chief Rabbit, a call back to the lost paragraph perhaps. He speaks plainly as the last of his group arrive, commenting on what a large warren this must be. This seems to strike the wrong note. Yet if their numbers are less than the holes they saw suggest, then why might this be? There is no sign of disease. Hazel's modesty to himself about how he might just not be a good speaker avoids him addressing the glaring issue of why such a large warren seems to have so few rabbits. The two groups mingle and get to know each other without words. This is explained as being the rabbit way of doing things. One problem with this... If it's rare for two groups of rabbits to meet each other in such a large underground space in the dark, then how can this be an occasion which has established conventions, or am I just being too picky there? 
In any case, trust between the two groups is established and the social dynamics behind this are described very convincingly. But Fiverr keeps himself apart from proceedings and is avoided as a result. Hazel finds himself between two rabbits, a couple, whom he leaves the great burrow with. Having settled in another burrow with them, he asks the buck if Cowslip is chief rabbit. The buck responds by asking Hazel if he is chief of his group. Hazel's response only arguably makes sense if the lost paragraph at the end of chapter 11 is included, as he seems worried how Bigwig and Silver, the two owls or rabbits from Sandleford, will react if they learn that he has said he is. He says he's been trying to lead them, but isn't sure how they would react to him being called chief. The buck responds that in this warren they don't have a chief rabbit. Is this really the case? Or just a pretense, like in some human, quote, egalitarian groups? The buck tells Hazel that they don't need to worry about the things a chief is meant to worry about, such as dealing with a lil or supervised digging. A lil stay well away from this warren. A homba, or fox, that came nearer the previous winter had been shot by, quote, the man who comes through the fields, end quote. As for digging, there is no need. The buck says no one has dug there in his lifetime. A lot of burrows are lying empty. There are even rats living in one part of the warren who the man also kills sometimes. They have no need to explore the surrounding country as they have plenty of good food where they are. The buck ends by saying that Hazel's group will be happy living there. But he doesn't sound very happy. Hazel tries asking where the man... But he is interrupted by the buck introducing himself as Strawberry. He also introduces his partner as Nildro Hain, meaning Song of the Blackbird, though the word order is unclear. She is the first female rabbit to be named in Watership Down, though she still has yet to speak. Her good looks are commented upon by Hazel, but she is not given a voice. One day... I will do an episode on sexism in Watership Down, which really does date it as a book. However, for now, it is worth noting that her name introduces a convention of those in Watership Down only being known by their names in Lapine in the text, rather than the English translation usually used for bucks. Strawberry begins a long explanation about the Warren and its burrows that seems to be a way of avoiding Hazel's questions going any further. They begin a tour of the Warren, which is impressively dry and warm. They meet Acorn, who is also being given a tour, and he compliments Hazel on finding such a place for them to live. Having passed a place that smells of rats, they end up in a pit, with a view of the night sky, which is unusual in a Warren, where tunnels are usually curved. One curved wall of the pit is formed from bricks, laid by humans, Strawberry says this is the outer wall of an old well. Another wall is flat because of a, quote, man thing behind it. It is unclear what this might be. Hazel notices stones have been pushed into the surface of this wall at regular intervals. He asks what they are for. Strawberry explains that this is a shape, and that it is Im- it is meant to be Elacrera stealing the king's lettuce, This work of art makes absolutely no sense to Hazel, for whom the very concept is meaningless. It was created by a rabbit called Laburnum a long while time ago, whose name in Lapine means poison tree. There are other such shapes in the Warren as well, according to Strawberry. All of this is completely confusing to Hazel. He starts to touch the stones, but Strawberry tells him not to in case he damages it. Hazel starts to ask where are but is interrupted again by a long monologue from Strawberry about how Hazel's group can eat all they want underground in the Warren and sleep in the Great Burrow, or wherever they like. As they make their way back, Hazel realises that any question that includes the word where is interrupted. He puts this to the test by deliberately asking another such question. Strawberry immediately shouts into a burrow to ask if the occupant is going to join them in the Great Burrow. As they move on, after no response, Hazel checks the soil at the entrance of this burrow. It is very obviously unoccupied. (laughs) 
In the next episode, Hazel's group learn more about this strange warren, which Fiverr doesn't want to stay in at all, even at night.